Hi, welcome to another episode of Getting High on Anthropology. My name is Marty Otanez. Today we have a guest, Katie Scheibler. Welcome to the show, Katie. Thank you for having me. So we're going to talk about cannabis and pesticides. Um, but before we do that, you have this extensive experience in uh, the area of compliance. So tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. So after I graduated college, my first job, essentially right out of college, was working for a small environmental health and safety consulting firm, uh, mostly with large federal land management clients, EPA, Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management. And then I worked there for about three years. And then from there, I went to the Colorado Department of Agriculture and then worked there for approximately five years and then worked briefly for Marijuana Enforcement Division. During your time at the Department of Agriculture, you became familiar with pesticides in the cannabis sector. So what are the things um, that you learned or what are some of the concerns that you have? So one of the biggest issues that exists and will exist for at least a while is that uh, there is no federal oversight on cannabis. And so as far as pesticides are concerned, um, because of that, uh, states are left to their own devices to make the rules and regulations behind how pesticides in cannabis are regulated. Um, and that comes with its own challenges. So at the federal level, we have the illegal, you know, Schedule One um, with cannabis listed there. So it's it's uh, it's illegal. But what about the EPA? What's the role of the EPA in terms of cannabis and pesticides? Sure. So EPA, um, under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, regulates pesticides, their registration, their creation, their application. Um, and so they regulate the use of of those pesticides on plants, um, just not on cannabis yet. So CDA, the Colorado Department of Agriculture, has a list of pesticides. So for people who aren't familiar with the list, tell us a little about why the list is important and how is it consistent or inconsistent with the federal law? Sure. So the list was created. Originally, the department was asked to create a list of pesticides that were banned, that would not be allowed for use on marijuana, on cannabis. And that was just too burdensome. It didn't make sense to do it that way. So the department instead, um, working with the governor's office, created this CDA pesticide list, which is essentially a list of pesticides that are not a violation to use. And I want that to be clear to anybody who's in the industry. Um, it's not that they're recommended for use. It's not that they're technically legal to use. It's just that CDA could not find a user or a grow in violation for using those pesticides based on the label language. And so it's consistent with the federal law in that the label, the pesticide label is the law. Whatever the label says is what you have to do. Um, so for the list, for example, most of those um, have really broad label language that say something like for use on all plants or for use in greenhouses. And because that's so broad, it can be applied to cannabis. Now, when you worked with the um, CDA, you were able to go into grows, to cultivation facilities. Were there cases where you saw pesticides being applied when they shouldn't have? Uh, often, yes. Um, especially at the very beginning when the department first got involved in the regulatory process of figuring out what they wanted to do um, you know, with the gray area of regulatory oversight in cannabis, um, they were being misused frequently. I will say that many of the growers in the state have been educated, and, and um, I would say that misuse has decreased, but it is still very common. And so now with your current work um, in the area of pesticides and cannabis, can you describe what the status of your project is? I don't really know what to say other than I really just want to protect the consumers that come to Colorado and the workers who work in Colorado in the industry from misuse, um, you know, from bad, bad business practices. Um, and so right now, essentially, it's just trying to educate the public and educate workers on what their rights are. And then when you look at the universe of uh, regulatory agencies and bodies and um, other authorities in the area of pesticides regulations, which body is doing the implementation or the compliance issues that you feel is appropriate or what room, what uh, things need to be improved? Sure. So as far as pesticides go, the Department of Agriculture has statewide uniformity, meaning they are the agency that, they're the only agency that has regulatory oversight about the use of pesticides. Interestingly, in marijuana enforcement's rules and regulations, they've incorporated the Pesticide Applicators Act under CDA into their own laws. And so 
there's some leniency there that another agency could enforce pesticide law if they wanted to. Um, I don't think that's necessary. I think CDA is the right agency um, for the job in terms of regulating pesticides on any agricultural commodity, including cannabis. The problem is what happens when a pesticide has been misused and you have contaminated product. Um, that's where several agencies come into play and there is some discrepancy on who thinks who should be responsible. And when you say this discrepancy, you're talking about agencies like the MED, the CDPHE, and the CDA. That's correct. So can you tell us a bit more, like is the MED stepping up to the plate or is CDPHE doing what it uh, should be doing? Currently, as it stands, if a pesticide is misused and cannabis, if marijuana becomes contaminated, the only real agency with authority is the Marijuana Enforcement Division with some health authority from CDPHE. In, in my eyes, as a professional in this, in this industry and as a, a compliance expert, if a pesticide is applied to an agricultural commodity and it should not be, that product should be destroyed 100% of the time. And that's not currently happening. There are, um, without getting into too many details, there are some ways that as a grower, your product could be on hold for a period of time and then released. So this seems um, scary for consumers and of course with workers being potentially exposed to uh, pesticides. So what um, has the industry done to either uh, push for leniency or to demonstrate that they're doing you know, good business practices in the area of pesticides? Sure, so there are really good businesses out there. There are several that have gone the route of trying to grow organically. They can't use that term, but um, essentially good uh, good business practices, good integrated pest management, using pesticides as a last resort, using biologicals, knowing how to grow the plant in a way that doesn't necessarily need um, chemical applications regularly. On the other hand, there are growers out there who are applying many pesticides all the time, twice a day, many times a day, um, and that, that's just not good practice for growing agricultural commodities. And so, in the big scheme of things, politically, there are, there are businesses out there who have a lot of money and they have people who work with them to try to work against agencies who may prevent them from operating they want to operate. So take us through um, with a few more details. If there is cannabis that's demonstrated to have some pesticides in them, uh, they should be destroyed, the plant should be destroyed, but they're not. And so what are companies doing to either ensure that the samples that are provided are clean or like is there strategies that they use to try to keep themselves protected against any kind of um, penalties? Sure. So uh, there's, there's two things. So there is required testing. Um, there are ways to circumvent that. And I've only seen it a handful of times, although it's not something that growers would necessarily be honest about. But I have had growers tell me that they have a few sets of plants that they just keep in a room somewhere. And when they need to send in tests, they take from those plants of which pesticides have never been applied. Additionally, I've seen, um, and I think is evident in many of the sample results that I have gotten is that growers are starting to use minimal amounts of the pesticides that they either can use or shouldn't be using in hopes that they don't get detected. That's creating a whole host of, of their own problems. Um, additionally, they'll, you know, they'll do things like if there's mold issues, they may microwave them or dip them in, in products that they shouldn't be. Um, so there are still bad business practices that they're trying to sort of skate getting detected. Now, specifically with the CDA, are there um, penalties that are insufficient, for example, that create a climate where companies might risk using pesticides? Yeah, I say this regularly to people who ask me about it is that, um, you know, CDA only has their fining authority you know, that's written into statute. If, if you are a grower and you're misusing pesticides as a, a course of doing business because you don't want to lose your entire crop, um, if, you, if this is the first time you've ever been caught, generally you're gonna receive a cease and desist order if there's no other major issues. That's a slap on the wrist. That's what you would get as a homeowner for misusing a pesticide. Um, if, you're, if you get caught a second time doing the same thing, misusing a pesticide in a way that you know, the label says you should not, um, you might get a $200, might get a $400 fine. It's just, in my experience, is not sufficient to deter bad behavior for those people who continue to do so. And I've also heard uh, through a number of presentations that you've given that companies um, look at labs, private labs, to have their samples tested, and then the labs are testing things that are different than what CDA might test. Sure. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So if you're in, in, in the middle of an investigation for whatever reason, and CDA comes out and decides to sample your plants, 
um, especially if they don't know what they're looking for, they may run a whole host of, of um, tests through their equipment. I believe, and the number is not coming to me right now, but it's something like 200 and we'll just say 200 plus active ingredients that can be screened for on these plants at any time. Um, the private labs, the required testing for um, plants that should be going through testing regularly is 13 or 14 active ingredients. Um, and it's just not even a close enough percentage. So growers have gotten, I should rephrase, bad growers have gotten smart to know what products aren't gonna be detected. Yeah, this is pretty serious, especially from the perspective of the consumer, because you would think consumers want high quality, low cost, pesticide free uh, cannabis. But from what I'm learning from you is we need to be educated in terms of the, the, uh, per, the consumption of cannabis and asking the right questions. Yes. Um, another issue I wanted to ask you about in the area, especially with your expertise, what are the specific um, problems or do you have evidence that there are health consequences of consuming cannabis that has pesticides in it? Sure, so there's a, there's a few, and actually I think it was the New York Times just released um, an article on how they found contaminants in vape cartridges. So something similar um, that I don't think a lot of people know is that the product they were talking about, Michael Butanil, was used very frequently several years ago. It's still used, but not as commonly. Um, Colorado Green Labs in like 2015 or so did a study, um, a pyrolysis study on Michael Butanil on cannabis. Um, they took some data from some other places as well that determined essentially that when uh, plants, cannabis in this case, has Michael Butanil on it and it's ignited, um, it cleaves off a hydrogen atom and becomes hydrogen cyanide. Um, additionally, there's been some studies done on some other insecticides that in different countries specifically, I think um, Pakistan was one of them and I'm not remembering the other, um, the pesticide chlorphenopyr, which is an insecticide, has actually killed people in other countries. Yeah, these are pretty important issues for the public to, to know about. Um, with your work and the people you've been talking to, what are some responses that you've gotten with some of this information that you're, you're circulating? I think most people are shocked, um, but the majority of people, at least the majority of consumers that I've talked to here and there that have been consuming cannabis for many years, whether it was legal or not, um, seem to think that you know the pesticides are just kind of Part of, part of doing business. You know, the, the weed that they got from wherever they got it years ago probably had it on it, and so they're okay with, with consuming it now. And that's just not, um, that's not the way it should be. Voters voted on this to make sure that it was regulated like tobacco and alcohol. Um, and in terms of pesticide use, at least, uh, I don't think we're quite hitting the mark. With, with some of the individuals that I've talked with who are chronic uh, consumers of cannabis, uh, they've said to me that the best way to know what's in it is you grow it yourself. That's true, for sure, yeah. Now, the other issue, which I think is really important, just so people know, um, if consumers and others want to educate themselves about companies, um, there is something that you mentioned called Cora. So for people who haven't heard of Cora, can you explain what it is and then how has it been helpful uh, in your work and any obstacles that you might have faced? Sure, so Cora is the Colorado Open Records Act and it's the act that governs um, transparency for agencies for the public. I don't know the law that well other than the pieces that I did when I worked for CDA and MED and then a little bit on the side, but essentially if I ever wanted to request let's say sample results from a grower, I can do that through CDA, assuming that they're not currently under investigation or something like that. Um, additionally, CDA has all of their enforcement actions listed once they're completed on their website. Um, but the easiest way to do that, at least with pesticides, is to call the department, talk to them about what you want, um, walk through it with them. They really are here to educate growers as well as the public and then figure out what you want to request. And then in a few days time, depending on how big the request is, that you'll receive that information. Okay, so in some ways, um, the documents and records you can get, it's a treasure trove of information to just sort of track different patterns and different themes. And so have you found any interesting patterns in terms of either complaints or other issues through the documents research? Sure, I mean, there's all, all different kinds. Specifically related to cannabis, I think we're starting to see um, less complaints. And I don't know if that's because there's been more compliance or people just aren't really sure who to complain to. Um, I see that often. In terms of worker protection, um, there's a, a law that growers are required to follow and, and those complaints have gone down significantly. So I'm hoping that that means growers are educated, um, they're beginning to understand the importance of protecting their workers and therefore we're seeing less than we did you know, two or three years ago. Yeah, no, that, I think that's good news. And I do know there's certain um, 
uh, like a list of things that are kind of um, reoccurring in the complaints. Can you share in terms of pesticides and cannabis cultivation workers some of the problems that uh, are standing out with some of the complaints? In common themes and complaints. Um, I think still most frequently at least in the things that I've collected, some of the most common issues, violations that are seen in complaints are, um, you know, workers are concerned that they don't have the right personal protective equipment or they're not given the right personal protective equipment. Um, another common theme is ventilation. Maybe they're applying and they're not getting the right kind of um, ventilation over the amount of time. Um, CDA often received complaints about mold and other health issues, which they don't regulate, but that was also very common in almost every complaint related to pesticides was the amount of mold either in the grow facility or on the products themselves. So that's that's pretty common. And actually, MED released, a, I think it was their yearly update that um, sort of showed that common theme was that mold was an issue this year. And they you know, are planning on continuing to see it as an issue through their uh, required testing. Yeah, I know from uh, my work, I've seen uh, some issues of mold exposure and some workers concerned. So I think one way to kind of wrap things up is um, could you talk about some of the behavior of companies, especially those who might um, uh, want to push for leniency in terms of you know cannabis with pesticides and why it's not being destroyed? Like, is there uh, evidence or do you have anecdotal information of companies either trying to dilute the regulations or just maybe not acting on the best behalf of consumers? Sure. So my experience with um, at least one of the large industry groups is that they really aren't in it to protect consumers. They aren't really in it to protect workers. Uh, they've actively, you know, pushed against um, legislation to protect workers. Um, anecdotally, uh, that's true also from my conversations with people who are associated with those groups um, and sort of what they want to do. Additionally, I think that um, the industry groups are maybe speaking to the agencies that, that want to um, create leniency with pesticides and maybe the conversations between these agencies aren't going the rec direction they should be because of these industry groups. I don't have evidence of that, but um, most recently there's been some emails that have discussed trying to create leniency on what pesticides are allowed to be used um, coming from other agencies to CDA. And uh, I, I can only assume that the industry group is probably involved in that somehow just based on previous experience. It might be great to end uh, because I know I'm, I'm interested, and I'm sure some of the viewers are, uh, what should consumers ask when they go into a dispensary or they're purchasing cannabis? What are a couple questions or you know things that they should know about um, when they do these purchases? So one thing is you're going to want to know whether or not the bud tenders, the, the product that you're buying, is it wholesale? Is it coming from their own grow? And if, if they don't, they should know that. But if they don't know that, that's a problem. They really want to know what pesticides, what agricultural chemicals are being applied to cannabis. It's supposed to be listed. The problem is you have to rely on growers to be honest about what's being used and making sure that it's on those labels. I think it's just um, good to have a conversation with those bud tenders, but if you're really an active consumer and you want to know, try to get a tour of the facility that grows the product and, and see what you see when they're out there applying. You know, get copies of their records if they'll give them to you. If they don't, I think that's a sure sign that you probably want to look somewhere else. Katie, it's been great talking with you, learning about your work, and I really appreciate your commitment to this, and I hope to have you on in the future to have a follow-up with some of the work you're doing. Sure. You've been watching Getting High on Anthropology. My name is Marty Otanias. Thanks for tuning in, and see you next time. When I first moved to Colorado in 2015 for college, I had a feeling of living in the future while shopping at a dispensary. Looking around the store, I couldn't contain the feeling of amazement. Seeing the innumerable glass jars of sativa and indica flowers on the shelves, the fancy packages with eye-catching graphics on the label, and TV screens with cannabis-related advertisements on them, it all felt entirely foreign to me when looking back on my experiences buying weed back home in Tennessee. At home, it was a shot in the dark as to what strain I was smoking, and the bud came in cellophane wrapping from a pack of cigarettes, or maybe a Ziploc bag, if I was lucky. Little did I know, there was a whole new world of concentrates, dab rigs, vaporizer technology, and more for me to begin learning about. 
Smoking weed used to be something no one talked about where I grew up. But now, when I come home to visit family, and I talk to people about living in Denver, they can't seem to ask me about anything other than marijuana. A couple of summers ago, I remember hanging out at my friend David's house while I was home for the summer. We had just finished smoking a joint when his dad walked in the door. I quickly got nervous, expecting him to be mad about us smoking a joint in the house. Instead, he began talking with me about my medical card and how he loves smoking marijuana and has smoked it for years. When David, his dad, and myself finally stopped talking, I couldn't shake the feeling of disbelief that David's dad, an affluent financial manager, was comfortable openly talking with me about using a drug that is still illegal at the state and federal level. It made me think about how traveling outside of Tennessee to Colorado opened my eyes to what the industry is really like. It's conversations like the one I had with David's dad that slowly begin to change the negative stigma associated with marijuana consumption, that of the lazy, drugged up pothead stoner that just floats through life. This negative stigma fades away even more when you can walk into a dispensary to get an eighth of flour and it feels no different than walking into a Walgreens to pick up a prescription. The post-prohibition era is not all good. Evidence suggests that in two and a half years, five companies may control the majority of the industry market share. The potential for this hyper-commercialization of the industry bothers me. While I'm a proponent of free market operations and capitalism, I'm aware of the exploitation of industries that can arise from high levels of commercialization. Cannabis entrepreneurs that operate the big chain store dispensaries tend to focus too much on profits and branding, while neglecting aspects of customer service and product quality. It's easy to walk into any Livewell or Native Roots dispensary and find a cheap $80 ounce that'll get you high and not break the bank. But there's no telling what kind of unhealthy chemicals and molds are in the product that's being smoked. In the post-prohibition era, it is my wish for all consumers to experience the same environment that I enjoy here in Colorado. An environment with personal interactions with bud tenders, discussing differences between strains of bud and concentrates, and choosing a quality product one that fits best for what I need, not just something that gets me high. Buying cannabis no longer needs to feel like buying drugs from a trap house, but rather like buying supplements from a health store. I am a chronic pothead. I get it, the first step to curing addiction is to admit you have one. Before you judge me, let me explain why my pot addiction isn't what you think it is, and maybe you'll finally understand me just a little bit more. I wake up every morning around 7 a.m. to tend to my plants. It can be laborious at times. Generally, it takes me no more than 15 minutes to care for them all. My ritual begins with placing them in direct sun, where most of them grow best, and ending with me watering them every other day. For me, this is a routine that begins and ends with a feeling of satisfaction, calm, and genuine happiness. They are at once something I can take care of, yet they also take care of me. I thrive off of budding plants and their ripe flowers, though I admit sometimes it doesn't always work out. Good thing I'm cultivating just for me. The diversity of the plant profile is insane. Some have rich, dark green leaves that curl at the end, some have thin, long stems while others are short and stocky. Undoubtedly, they're hard to keep. Not only do they need certain light cycles, watering and nutrient regimens, and planting schedules, they're also susceptible to mold and small insects. In general, I'd say I'm a damn good grower. And I'll admit, it costs a lot of money to maintain this lifestyle. Between all my containers, the pots themselves, and my affinity to grow more, this greenery doesn't grow itself. Wait, you thought I was talking about marijuana? Cannabis? No, not me. Both my roommates, however, are chronic self-acclaimed potheads. Previously, that label has been dangerous. Indeed, pot, marijuana, cannabis, Mary Jane, and the devil's lettuce have been stigmatized and segregated from the scientific benefits of plants for far too long. Both of my roommates enjoy the same satisfactions as I do for my plants, the geraniums, the succulents, and the dumb cane, yet are stigmatized for what plant they adore the most. An era of post-prohibition reaffirms that plants are just plants. While I recognize a multitude of plants can be manipulated, the average plant consumer is seeking the surface level benefits, not an underlying malevolence. 
My plants provide me beauty, responsibility, and more. Cannabis, like any other plant, yields those qualities alongside medicinal benefits. If being a pothead ostracizes you, then so be it. I'd rather live in a world where the plants that help my roommates are as valid and accepted as mine. For our own individual reasons, we all sought out plants as a medium in an effort to stay rooted. Now, we're thriving. Introduction to cannabis was at the age of 15. My first use was solely experimental. I was curious on why my teachers asked why I was so temperamental. The underdressed anger grew to be monumental. I was told that it would calm me down, relax my gentle mental. I felt calm without my mind racing and overthinking. I loved this feeling because I was escaping my own mental prison. I experienced the essence of being fully receptive and just being reactive. Under the influence, I realized what was making me so hyperactive. The preservation of my father's relationship was always a concern to his firstborn son that he deserved. Preserving the relationship was the goal, but instead we just diverged even more. Always stating that he was going to leave one day. After so many times, I was just numb to the pain. My use of cannabis was to heal my emotional pain. I saw a life with no father from the viewpoint of my friends whose fathers were convicted with the possession of marijuana. The war on drugs caused so many relationships to end. Now I scroll through my news feed. I read that the federal government finally legalized weed. I didn't know what to believe. It seemed unachievable, just knowing that the state of Louisiana was giving out mandatory life sentences to those racial minorities selling weed. This occurred during a time in my life where I'm witnessing the prejudice and discrimination of violent acts African Americans are being exposed to. On the other hand, states who legalized weed like Colorado saw an economic boost from the above ground cannabis market and I'm seeing old white men profit. Witnessing the hypocrisy, I'm telling you right now, release all my people and pardon the petty convictions that spent the majority of their time in the system. Eradicate the policy that was responsible for the absence of the male figures in minority communities, leaving mothers to raise sons, resulting in children questioning where the whereabouts of their father. This federal legalization was a progressive step forward, but what we lost was sad to see. So many casualties due to the former war on drugs. The warfare defeated the purpose. Instead of preventing drugs from entering our communities, drugs flooded our streets and drugs were done on the Wall Street. There was no ethical issue, just people who strongly held on to their convictions. This cannabis industry is in dire need for some color, like our dying coral reefs. Not just CEOs, I'm talking about head farmers, cultivators, and every other job that's within the industry. Pay reparations to those families who were stifled or divided by the system. Give them the tools to contribute to the cannabis science and society. Because science is organized knowledge, wisdom is organized life experiences. Those who demonize cannabis lack the knowledge due to their inexperience. Don't disregard the benefits for those who find sensation of its glory. Just remember, struggle is the common enemy, but weed is the remedy. 